Welcome to Untold Stories of the Torah, a masterclass in Jewish history, presented by Rabbi Shmuel Aber. Here's the story of Shimshon, also known as Samson. And before we begin, let's ask a few questions. Number one, what was the Nazarite, the Nazir status of Shimshon? And if he was a Nazir, as he's famously known with long hair and a vow to never cut it throughout his life, why is it that he was allowed to impurify himself with hand-to-hand combat and kill so many people? A Nazarite, a Nazir is not allowed to impurify himself. Additionally, another question is, was Shimshon, was Samson a tzaddik? Was he a righteous person without any form of drive towards evil, you know, like all the other great righteous holy men that we've had that that have led the Jewish people in the past? Or was he a regular guy trying to do his best in life with a very important mission who dealt with temptation like any regular person and, you know, struggled to withhold himself sometimes and sometimes it was successful? Additionally, if Shimshon was an upstanding member of society and a great terrorist scholar, then what was the legal justification for all the large-scale attacks that he launched against the Plishtim? He killed a lot of people, and he didn't bring them to court. He killed them in the streets. So how does that work? And fourthly, what we're going to start off talking about today, the long introduction story we have of Shimshon's parents about how Shimshon was originally born. Why do we need to hear all these details between Shimshon's parents, Manoach and Tzalalfoynis, and their encounter with the angel and back and forth? It seems very repetitive, and it seems almost unnecessary to the entire story. In order to understand the story, or maybe as just an introduction to the story, it is important to mention that the story of Shimshon, or the time of Shimshon, wasn't the first time when the Plishtim are mentioned. The Plishtim were a group of, of a nation, and it could have been multiple nations all combined, who lived in the southwest area of Israel, nowadays the Gaza Strip, and they terrorized, terrorized and tyrannized the Jewish people in, in ways that were horrific. And they mainly started in the story in the time of Shimshon, right at the end of the period of the judges, a good over 300 years after the Jewish people came into Israel already. They are mentioned briefly during the times of Shamgar ben Anas. He was a ruler during the second judge, and he passed away in the year 2658, together in the same year as the second judge. He only ruled for one year, and he did have this amazing miracle where he took, he took an ox goad, and he struck 600 plishtim. But as Devara mentions in her famous praise to Hashem, it was a very temporary redemption. It was not, it was not a full-scale redemption by any standard. And the Plishtim were rather quiet for the next few hundred years. And then, starting in the, the start of our story, the Plishtim become a bigger problem. They actually start to harass the Jewish people, start killing Jewish people, putting taxes, and they became the overlords over the Jewish people and over Israel, creating a lot of problems, which is only amplified with time. And during the times of Shimshon, of course, this is who he had to contend with. The Plishtim themselves is an incredible story, which I want to dedicate a podcast at one time, talking about the intricate and complicated history of who the Plishtim really were because it, there's many different opinions, and they all do not work together very well. But the Plishtim, it seems to, to be that the Plishtim were the son of Mitzrayim, the son of Ham. Noach had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafes. Ham had a son, Mitzrayim. And Mitzrayim had two sons who switched wives with each other. And from the, that relationship of, Pas, of Pasrusim and Kaslusim, Kasluchim, Switching the wives, Plishtim came from that relationship. They were thieves, they were bachelors, and they were still each other's wives, and this was the origin of the Plishtim. It seems to be that there were, might have been multiple groups of Plishtim, or people who identified as the Plishtim, whether the Ivim or the Chivim, etc. Very, very interesting, and we'll dedicate it to another time. But what's important to know was that Avraham made a peace treaty with them, and that's the reason why they were primarily left alone. Avraham made a peace treaty when he came into Israel far before Yehoshua came in, and Avram made a peace treaty, and they agreed that themselves, their children, and their grandchildren will not go to war against each other. And the basic understanding is that at the time when Yehoshua came into the land, the grandchildren were still alive. And so Hashem got a different group of Plishtim to 
kick out the original plishtim so the Jewish people would be able to legally not have a problem with conquering the lands. But even so, the Jewish people left the plishtim alone. Until the time, until this time of Shimshon, the plishtim were primarily left alone, and it was going to be Shimshon who was going to be the one to attack them. But let's first talk about Shimshon's parents before Shimshon was even born. Shimshon's father was a man by the name of Manoach, an incredibly righteous man. His name even comes from rest, which is a, a, another reference. Manoach is a reference to prophecy. He managed to talk to an angel. He had this incredible prophetic experience, and that's the, the origin of his name. Manoach's father came from the tribe of Don. Of course, Manoach was from Don, and so was Shimshon. But his mother came from the tribe of Yehuda. And Manoach got married to a woman by the name of Tzalal Foynis, all one word. And she was from the Tsarasi family of Yehuda, a very famous Yehuda family. In fact, it's even mentioned in Divrei Hayamim. She is mentioned in Divrei Hayam. She was the daughter of Ra'aya, the, 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 the son of Sheva, the son of Kalev, the son of Chor, from Sheva Yehuda. She's a very prestigious family. So this Manoah, who was from Don and whose mother was from Yehuda, married a woman also from the tribe of Yehuda and moved to the Tsara area, which most people point out to being in Yehuda itself. So even though he didn't come from Yehuda himself, he lived in Yehuda area. Tzalal Foynis was an incredibly special woman, as we're going to talk about later on. There are many opinions that say that she was far greater than her husband, Manoach. Manoach was incredibly, incredibly great, and Tzalal Foynis was even greater than him. She was a Gilgal. She was a reincarnation of Oin ben Peles' wife. Oin ben Peles was a man who lived many, many years earlier. He joined the Koirach rebellion against Moshe. And as the rebellion began to heat up, his wife told him, what are you doing involving yourself in this, in this argument? The Gemara in Sanhedrin says, she told him, whatever the, the solution of this argument is going to be, you're going to lose. Right now, you're a nobody to Moshe, and you have no real power. Kairach going to get in power and kick away Moshe, but you're again going to be a nobody to Kairach. This, you, this is a lose-lose situation. There's really no reason for you to invest yourself into this fight. Oyn told his wife, but I already promised I would be there. So she told her husband, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Koirach's group, although they're going against Moshe, they consider themselves to be very pious and righteous people. So she gave him a lot of wine. He got drunk. So now he was, you know, he was drunk and he was off the hook from being forced to keep his word. He was drunk. He wasn't his fault. And she stood outside the tent and she removed her, head, her hair covering. And it was something which Koyach's men couldn't get themselves to, to look at a married woman's hair being shown. So as they came to pick up their good buddy Oin for the, for the big famous sh a showdown between Moshe and Koyach, they came close, they saw that her hair was uncovered, and so they left. And in this way, Koyach and his entire group all got swallowed by the ground, and Oin ben Peles's very clever wife managed to save his life. The Gemara in Baba Vassar says that Tzalal Foynes on the compound word. Tzalal means to stare at. Foynis is an angel. And the double expression is, as we're going to say in the story, she met with the angel twice. So that's the double expression. Manoach was exceptionally uh, righteous. The, it says that Ish Echa, there was one man, and the, the Medrash says he was as great as 31 Sadikin, which is the Gematria. And Yonis and Abshit also points out, it's important to mention, he came from the tribe of Don. At that particular time, there was a dreadful cult called the Pesel Micha, which was an idol-worshipping cult which grew up and exploded as the Don decided to expand their borders to the very, very north area of Israel. And he lived at the same time and was part of the tribe. And it's important to, of course, mention that he most certainly was not involved in this dre dreadful idol-worshipping cult. He was a very, very righteous man, even though many, many of his tribe got entirely swept up by this cult. At the same time that Boyaz lived, at the same time that Manoach lived, there was a very righteous man by the name of Boyaz. Boyaz is very famous as later on becoming the husband of Rus and becoming the great-great-grandfather of King David, of David HaMelech. But at this point, he's not married to Rus. And Ivson, Boyaz, the same person, he made 120 wedding feasts. He had 60 children, 30 boys and 30 girls. And each feast for the wedding, for the 60 children, he had one feast in his own house and one feast in the, in the in-law's house. It's 120 wedding feasts for 60 children. And 
all of these feasts, he didn't invite Manoach to any of the parties because he said to himself, Manoach is like a sterile mule. How's he going to pay me back? I'm going to invite him to my party. How's he going to invite me back? He has no children. Manoach and, and, and Salalfoinis were married for so many years without any children. So Boya said, why would I invite him to the party when he clearly can't invite me back to any party because he's not going to be throwing a wedding. As a punishment for this, all of his children from his first marriage died. And his only descendant was from later on from the story of Rus when he got married to Rus. It was a different wife. And then he had one descendant, Oived, who became the famous grandfather of David HaMalach. The Ben Chai, of course, explains Boyaz was a great man. Why he, he wouldn't have been so petty. If I don't get a wedding invitation, I'm not inviting someone else to a wedding invitation. He was more concerned about shaming Monarch. He's going to invite Monarch to this fancy party, and Monarch's going to be at the party and feel so bad that he can't reciprocate. And Boyaz said, I'd rather not invite him. That way I don't have to give him that shame that he can't reciprocate. But that was a mistake. He was punished because Monarch didn't know the reason why he wasn't invited, and he became extremely sad. And the the effect was that Boyaz, even though he meant very well and he didn't want to shame Monarch, he ended up insulting him very much. The Arizal writes in Shah Mitzvah that although, and then this is an idea that we already have, but the, the Arizal explains that the Manoir wasn't a great scholar compared to how great he could have been. And the Arizal explains a beautiful idea of the two different levels of eating and that Manoir only served Hashem with one and not the other one, the preparation of eating and the actual eating itself. And Manoir was different than Avram Vino, a beautiful explanation. But we see the Arizal gives an, 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 an understanding into Manoir and his his level of Torah understanding wasn't as high as it could have been. So in spite of the fact that he was incredibly, incredibly great, he, there, are, there are elements of him that, that it sounds like he didn't know as much Torah as he could have known, whatever that means. Tzalal Foynes starts the story. Tzalal Foynes was barren and had no children. And of course, this is a double language. Barren would have been enough. Why did I say she was barren and had no children? So the Malbim explains that not only did she was she unable to have children, she never had any children. Some people are barren, but they've had they've had the experience of having children. But in her case, never had any children, and she um, was unable to have children. Additionally. We might think that there was another reason that she didn't have children. It had nothing to do with her barrenness. So therefore, the double expression to let us know both sides of the coin never had children, unable to ever have children. And it wasn't that she didn't try. She actually did try to have children, was unable to do it. The Radak and the Mitzvah David said, let's not read too much on the fact that the verse says she was barren and had no children. We see the same thing with Sarah. It's just the verse is trying to be extremely precise and make it very clear they had no children. So it uses a double expression. And the Avas Yoinasan, which is Yonas Nevshitz, he says the reason it's mentioned twice is to make it clear that she was the reason why they had no children and not him. And this leads us into what's the backdrop of the real of this story between Manech and Salal Fenis, because we're going to go back and forth. And most people go through this story, especially the first part of the story of Shimshan and the the story of the parents of Shimshan, they go through it very quickly and they're very confused as to why the verse seems to be repeating itself over and over again. It sounds very repetitive, and the whole story itself sounds very unnecessary. In the context of understanding this dynamic between Manoach and Salal Foynes, it becomes a lot easier to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Manoach and Salal Foynes, although they were married and they were both incredible people, they had a bit of a fight going on between them. Their marriage was 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 difficult because they were they were barren for so many years, and Manoach blamed his wife and said that she was the reason why they didn't have children. It was her fault. She was the barren one. And Salafoinis told her husband that he's the one that they, the reason why they don't have any children. And so this became a, ma- a matter of very very large contention between the two, each one blaming the other for not having any children. And so when the angel came to Tzalal Foynes, the angel came to Tzalal Foynes alone because it really was her that was barren. It wasn't Manoach. Boyaz had assumed that Manoach was barren, but in fact it wasn't. The real truth of the matter is, and the Torah testifies to this, Manoach was able to have children. Tzalal Foynes was the one that medically was unable. And so the angel said, if I go 
or Hashem said when he's sending the angel, if I go to Manoach and I tell Manoach, by the way, you are right in this massive argument that's been spanning their entire marriage, you're the you're right and it's her fault, that would have amplified the fight so much worse. Because now Manoach would have gone to his wife and said, look, I was right, you were wrong. So instead, Hashem said a way better a way better method to diffusing the fight would be instead of going to the person who was right and telling them they're right, which would just make the fight so much worse, go to the person who was wrong and tell them, by the way, you were wrong. That person will never mention it again because they know they're wrong. And that way, the fight just gets diffused without any further conflict. So the Medrash Rabbah says that's the reason why the, why the angel goes to, came to Talal Foynes and not to Manech, but the angel shows up to Talal Foynes. And the angel tells Talal Foynes in the form of a regular person, and the angel tells five pieces. This is how I'm dividing the, the instructions of the, of, the, of the angel into five different pieces. He tells her, number one, you are sterile and you have no children. So the angel quickly settled the score with Salal Foynes and told her her big fight with her husband, she should know that really he was right. And the reason why they don't have any children is because it's her, it, it, she's the one that's actually sterile. But uh, Manoach's not there, so this is a great way to diffuse it. Number two, she tells him, you will conceive and you will have a son. So what they've been waiting for for so many years, to have a child, the angel now tells them in, in the name of Hashem that they're going to have a child and they're gonna, they're gonna, she's going to conceive and bear a son. And what's so interesting is, and the Medrash Rabbah brings this down, why are we being told, why is the angel telling her that she's sterile and she has no children? She knows that. That's the most painful um, topic in her, in her life and in her marriage. Why is the angel just insulting us and just mentioning again, by the way, you should know, she knows. So why is the angel saying it? The angel's actually splitting up the moments. The angel's saying, at this point right now, you're still sterile and you have no children, but you will conceive and bear a son. And the rabbis explain, in Medrash Rabbah, they say, in that very moment, she conceived. She had the, she had, um, the DNA actually connect with each other in that very moment that the angel said that she's going to conceive and bear a son. The DNA connected and the actual conception happened inside of her in that actual moment. So when, he, when the angel said you will conceive, we just imagine that by loosely reading it that, oh, you know, at some point later, no. She literally had conception in that very moment. The DNA, the, the Manoach's DNA and her DNA connected in that very moment. The actual conception occurred, occurred now. That was point number two. Point number three was he now gives her instructions, something that we don't see at all, that she needs to change her behavior during pregnancy. And she just began her first moment of pregnancy right that moment. And the angel tells her that Hashem wants you to not drink any wine or have any alcoholic beverages and don't eat anything impure from that moment moving forward because now she's officially pregnant and from the moment when she's pregnant now it actually now it's actually something that she needs to start behaving because that child that she has inside of her is a nazir and we'll discuss what a nazir is momentarily and the bible now says the angel's telling to all phonists that it already begins while the child's in the womb that's that's what she needs to she needs to actually do now of course, the Gemara and Sota asked the question, wait a second. It says, don't drink wine and have, any, and have any alcoholic beverages. That's fair enough. But don't eat anything impure. What does that mean? Would eat anything what, what does that have to do with, with the story of Shimshan? No one's allowed to eat anything impure. Ah, sir, of Yitzchak, of the Academy of Ami. Until now, she was able to have something impure? She, and so, so the, what, what they explain is that Contact with impurity means that you're not allowed to have anything forbidden for a nazi. It's a re-emphasizing that nothing that's forbidden for a nazi she's allowed to have. Basically, it doesn't mean anything additionally that she has to do, but it's, it's, it's reinforcing the Nazarite laws, which we'll talk about, and that's what the meaning of not, nothing impure. And Rashi, for example, says, uh, it, it adds, for example, what if grapes are steeped in water, and then you dip the, the bread into that into that mixture maybe that's included as well there, there are more additional laws which might be deduced from the angel's extra words and then the fourth instruction that you're going to conceive and bear a son and no razor should go on should, should go on his head because this child will be a nazi to hashem from the womb and onwards again pay attention to the words because the, the words really mean are, are very nuanced and really need to be unpacked 
So the angel's telling um, um, Sal al is this child is going to be a Nazir. And number five is actually futuristic words. The angel tells uh, Sal al is by the way, you should know this child has an incredible future. He shall be the first to deliver the Jewish people from the Plishtim. But who yachel lahushia as Yisrael miyad Plishtim? And the Messiah of his comments and says, he will start. He'll start the process of delivering the Jewish people from the Plishtim. Of course, history tells us he most said the angel's words were very precise. He most certainly did not finish the story. He dealt a massive blow to the Plishtim, but Shmuel Hanavi is going to have to continue fighting the Plishtim. King Shaul and Yehoina's son are going to continue to have to fight against the Plishtim. And David and Malach was going to dedicate so much of his own kingship continuing to fight against the Plishtim. So Shimshon was only going to start the process, but for the next many, many decades, many Jewish leaders are going to have to contend with the Plishtim. The Gemara says that Hashem was telling the Jewish people that the peace accord with Avimelech and Avraham that the Jewish people had started, Yachel, it'll be broken. Shimshon, because the Plishtim had broken that pact and the Jewish people had you know, unofficially continued, decided, as the Mamelech explains, to keep that pact going, until the Plishtim attacked, the Jewish people kind of left them alone. But now that the Plishtim were subjugating the Jewish people and oppressing the Jewish people, it was going to be Shimshon who was now on the Jewish side going to break the pact and punish the Plishtim for the hor- horrific behavior towards the Jewish people. What's also really interesting, as Bamlez points out, Yachel, if you rearrange the words, is Chayel, a warrior. So you're already in the original message of the angel to Shimshon's mother, you already start to see that this is not going to be a regular child. It's going to be a person of extreme strength. And you see it in the actual words of the, of the angel to Tzalafonis. Now, the Barbanos says that Tzalafonis still had no idea she was talking to an angel. Salafun just assumed she was talking to a man of God, a, a Navi. Someone had spoken to Hashem, Hashem and, and came to come to a regular person, a very great person, definitely, someone she wasn't aware who, who it was, and had a, an instruction from Hashem for her. She had no idea it was an actual angel, according to the Abarab, and according to many, many of the opinions. Now, why did this person or this prophet come to only Salal Foynes and not to both. So Abarbanos says she was wiser than Manoach. It's very clear from the end of the story that she has a lot more understanding than he does. And so the fact that she was wiser, the angel said, okay, I'm going to come to Salal Foynes instead of coming to Manoach. The Abarbanos also says that practically speaking, the message only had only really pertained to Shimshon's mother, to, to, to Salal Foynes. However, Shimshon's father didn't really have to change his lifestyle he had to raise a very special child, but there was nothing he needed to do. He didn't need, he didn't need to become a Nazi or, or not drink any wine. He could drink whatever wine he wanted because it was her that was pregnant with Shimshon. So the Bible says, the angel said, well, there's no reason to go to Manoach. I'll just go to Tzalafonis. Medrash Rabbah, however, gives, a, gives us a really, really interesting insight and also a beautiful idea in, in Shalom Bayes as well. The reason why it, it, the angel came to was that had the angel come to Manoach, the angel would have had to lie. Because what the angel would have, what would the angel ha- had to say? The angel, in the case when it just when he just came to Tzalafoynis, he said, it's your fault. You're the one that's actually barren, which was the truth. But had the angel had to gone to Manoach, the angel would have never told the husband, by the way, you're right, and now created a massive fight, a furthering of the fight between Manoach and his wife. So what would the angel have done? The angel would have had no choice but to tell Manoach, by the way, Manoach, it's really your fault. You're the one that's barren. That's not the truth. But the angel would have never said something that would have amplified a fight between a husband and a wife. God does never want to find God's willing to lie, as is apparent from the story of Avraham, to keep a husband and wife in good relationships with each other. And so therefore, in order to avoid lying, Hashem said, you know what? It's better if I just send the angel to Tzalalfonis, and then I'll be able to say the truth, that it's really her that's the barren one, and it's not him, and that will keep, the, that will keep Hashem from having to lie and to, in order to keep the marital harmony between the two. Now, before we continue, it's very important to actually qualify what is a Nazir and how does it work? I'm not going to go through it at great length. I'm just going to explain enough in order to understand for the story moving forward and understand the the basic um, anatomy of what it means to be a Nazir and what it means to be a Shimshain Nazir. 
In Bar Midbar, it says like this, a man or a woman who sets himself apart by making a Nazir vow, and I'm going to use the word Nazir, Nazarite is the fancy English word, to abstain for the sake of Hashem. So something which a person abstains from, they're abstaining in their behavior for the sake of Hashem. And the laws of a Nazir is three, three different things. Number one, no drinking wine or any great products. And there are various different derivatives of that and different extensions of that, but that's the basic that's the basic of it. Number two, cutting one's hair is forbidden. And number three, a Nazir is not allowed to come in contact with the dead. Now, once the Nazir finishes their term of Nazirus, of the, the actual um, Nazir time, and if they don't qualify how much it is, the standard amount of a Nazir time is 30 days. So if a person commits to be a Nazir, doesn't specify how long, they become a Nazir for 30 days. After the 30 days are over, they go and they bring three sacrifices in the base of Migdash. They cut their hair, and now they become a regular person. They are no longer a Nazir. If they commit to, to, to become a Nazir twice, then they go through that entire process of 30 days twice. Not 60, but 30 and 30. And there are many, many different laws. Strongly recommend looking up the Rambam. The Rambam has a very, very clear breakdown of how the Nazir works. That's a regular Nazir time. Now, if a person predetermines, instead of saying a regular amount, actually qualifies and says a thousand days, for example, in that case, the person will need to spend a thousand days. And at the end of a thousand days, they'll then bring three sacrifices, they'll cut their hair, and they'll go about their life back to normal. There's a second type of Nazir. And this is called a Nazir Olam, a Nazir forever. This is someone who, instead of committing a predetermined amount of time or a vague amount of time where it's automatically 30 days, they say that they're willing to dedicate to be a Nazi for, their, for that person's entire life. In this case, they can't stop. They need to do it throughout their entire life. There's just one exception. There's like one difference. The difference is that once a year, every 12 months, they're able to trim the, the heaviness of their hair. Once they, they, of course, they bring a sacrifice. They bring three sacrifices in the base of Mikdash, but they're able to trim their hair a little bit, and then they go about once a year doing this, and their whole life they spend in the Nazir, the Nazir, the Nazir restrictions. And then there's the, the laws over here of Shimshon, a very, very unique Nazir, who, who has a very, different, a very big difference in the regular Nazir. Number one, Shimshon did not accept the, Nazir, the Naziris upon himself. An angel came, which is entirely unprecedented, and also Shimshon was under the age of Bar Mitzvah. A Nazin needs to be above the age of Bar Mitzvah to accept, you know, to, to, to make a vow that even counts. And if, in the exception of a Nazir, a father can make his child a Nazir, once he's born, of course, only the father can do it and not the mother, which is not what we see over here. And also a permanent Nazi. And by the way, interesting in history, we have, we know examples of permanent Nazi. Shmuel Haramasi, Shmuel, the famous prophet Shmuel, was a, a, a forever prof, a forever Nazi. Not like Shemshon, but he was an actual Nazi for his whole life. Once a year, he could cut his hair. Avshalom, the son of David Hamelach, the son that rebelled, famously. They were both allowed to cut their hair once a year, but Shimshon was never allowed to even trim his hair once a year. He was forbidden from that. A permanent Nazir has a much easier time getting out of becoming a Nazir. He could go to a rabbi, he could explain the, the situation, and a rabbi might be able to tell him under certain circumstances, you know what, in this particular case, you could get yourself out of it. But a Nazir like Shimshon could never get out of it. He was stuck forever and there was nothing he could do. And of course, the big difference on the flip side, what made Shimshon a lot more lenient than a regular Nazir, which again is so important to explore, is that Shimshon was allowed to come in contact with dead bodies. Shimshon not only was allowed, his entire mission depended on him coming in, dead, in contact with dead bodies. He killed a lot of people. And he didn't kill them in a way that, that um, you know, from far away or whatever it is, maybe some way to get out of it. In the case of one of the most famous stories, he literally used a donkey bone right next to the people he was trying to kill. And he, it didn't break his Nazarite vow, his Nazi vow. He continued being a Nazi. He didn't have to start from scratch again. He left his hair the way it was, and he continued about his life, and he, kill, and, he, and he killed people, and he came in contact with dead bodies. So now, Salafonius goes back home, and she tells her husband the most amazing story. She says, I, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel, very frightening. 
I didn't ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. This is the verse from the apostle. Very interesting. So Alphonse is so excited. She, she assumed, according to the Masoudist David, that the person that she had spoken to, and the Bible not too, the person she had spoken to was a, a prophet. But people need to understand, it's very important in the context of, of the way it was in those days, that prophets, when they said a mission from God, their entire face lit up, their entire being lit up. It was like talking to an angel. It was an angel-like experience when a person heard a prophecy from a Navi, from a prophet. So it's fully understandable why she said he looked like an angel of God. She assumed, of course, it was a prophet, but he, he looked like an angel of God because, you know, he, his entire being lit up when he told me the message. It was like an angel-like experience, but it was a person of God. Now, the verse says, interesting, again, the details really matter when trying to understand him. The verse says, I did not ask where he was from, and nor did he tell me his name. Why would he tell her, this is my name, when she asked the question, where do you come from? That's a strange, very strange expression. Again, when you're just not paying attention to it, it just sounds like, you know, he didn't, she didn't, she's just saying he didn't offer any information. But this is quite precise. Everything in Torah is absolutely precise. If she asked where you're from, why would he say, oh, this is my name? The rabbis explain like this. The barabin and the malbin say, in those days, people didn't ask where, what was, what's your name? They'd ask a more vague question. Where do you come from? And the person would understand, oh, you're asking me personal information. So they would say, I come from this place, and this is my name. We literally see it later, we see it later on in the story of, of Micha, which is a very tragic story, but we see that people asked, where are you from? And then the, then the name was volunteered. So you see this general, this was, this was the etiquette in the olden days. People didn't ask names, they asked places, and the name was given as an, as an exchange. The Eitz Yosef on, on Bamid Barabbas says that she knew it was an angel. But at the same time, she didn't want to show off in front of her husband. Her husband just... Um, missed out on an incredible experience not just to have prophecy but to hear a message from an angel she didn't want to throw it in his face look how much greater than that than than you i am you know i get to experience these incredible experiences so she she said i i i spoke to a messenger of god it was like an angel she kind of hinted i spoke to an angel but she didn't want to actually say it because she didn't want to throw it in his face so of course manoir wants to know what 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 did he tell you so salafina so says Three things that he that that she was told from the angel. And of course, the big question is, what about the rest of the message? The angel gave five massive points to to Tzalalfonis, five big things. And yet, when it came time for Tzalalfonis to tell her husband what she'd been told, this is very important. She skips out a whole bunch of stuff. And the question, of course, is why. But before we get there, what did she actually tell her husband? Tzalalfonis told Manoach like this: three things. Number one, the angel told me we're going to conceive and have a son. Number two. I'm not to drink any wine or any intoxicating or eat anything impure. And number three, the child's to be a nausea from the day of his womb until the day he passes away, to the day of his death. So what was missing? The three thing, main things that were missing, and there are a lot of more details, but I'll just summarize it. Number one, the whole thing about her being sterile and not able to have any children. She didn't mention a word about that. Number two, about a razor coming on his head. Didn't mention that either. And number three, that he should be the first to deliver the, Jew the Jewish people from the Pelishtim, or he will begin to deliver the Jewish people from the Pelishtim. However you want to read that verse, she didn't mention a word of that to her husband when telling over the bigger message. So, of course, the, the first one's rather easy. We kind of explain this. Now that she knows that this is her fault, and she's been the stir one, and the big argument that she's been having with her husband for their entire marriage turned out she was wrong about... Well, she's not going to volunteer that information anymore. She, she doesn't want to bring up something where she's clearly wrong. So as was intended, that argument very quickly died because there was nothing more to discuss. She didn't also, Mamala says, she didn't mention about the razor on his head because she didn't want anyone to know that there was a connection between his specialness, this child's special, specialness, and the cutting of the hair. And additionally, why didn't she tell her husband about the mission that, is, that their, their child was going to have? This child was going to I mean, be one of the most famous Jewish histories and in, in, one of the Jew, famous Jewish heroes in Jewish history. She doesn't mention a, a word to her, even her husband about the mission of this child. 
So the Metro Shabbos says that she was very scared that people would find out. This was, this was something which was very, very sensitive, and she didn't even want her husband to know that this child had this important mission. She was essentially endangering her child by giving this information to anyone. So she said, I'd rather no one find out. I won't even tell my husband that my ch our child is going to do something really, really great and he's destined to war against the Plishtim because if the Plishtim find out, our child or myself while pregnant are in, are in extreme danger. Now, why, when she told her husband, in addition to not mentioning three things, she also changed one detail. She said, this boy will be a Nazir from to Hashem, from the, from the womb, which is what the angel said, but she also added on a few words, to the day of his death. The angel most certainly did not say that. She added to the day of his death herself. So what's going on? What's the extra detail? So there's one opinion that says that she, she was trying to show her husband how serious this was. From the way that the message was given over, she understood that this was really serious. So she added to the day of his death to warn her husband, our son's death is dependent on this. It's so serious that if he doesn't keep it, that's going to be the day of his death. That's going to be the end of his, of, that's going to be basically the reason of it, the cause of his death. She's trying to show her husband, our son's life depends on this. Those that know the end of the story will know just how understanding this, this was. The Malbim and others say she didn't mention that because the Malach, the angel knew that Shimshon would break the vow before he passed away. She didn't know the future. So she mentions it, the angel doesn't mention it. And the Ma'am Laez says that although Shimshon did end up cutting his hair, it didn't stop his status. And so it was still true, like her words were still true, that he, he would continue to be a, a nausea, even though his hair was cut, he would still continue to be a nausea, even to the day of his death, even though, technically speaking, he, he, his hair was cut before. Why did she mention it and the angel didn't? For the angel was obvious. For her, she felt like she needed to mention it. So Salal so tells her husband this incredible message from the, from the angel. Manoach is extremely distressed. There's so much about the message that's so confusing. He knows how a nausea works. He's opened up a chumish before, and this doesn't sound like a regular nausea. And there seems to be so many missing pieces from this message. And also, he was very distressed that he wasn't great enough, whether, in this case, he didn't know yet that it was an angel. He most certainly did not know it was an angel. He thought it was a man, it was a prophet of Hashem. But he said, why am I not on the spiritual level to be able to receive the message too? Why did the message just come to my wife and it didn't come to me as well? So Manoach was extremely, extremely distressed upon hearing this, this story. And so the verse, the Pasuk says that Manoach begged Hashem and said, Hashem, please let the man of God who you sent come to us and teach us what, shall, what, what, shall, what we shall do to the child who will be born. He felt like there was so much more missing information. Additionally, as I just mentioned, he felt like he needed to be on the, he, he was upset he wasn't on the spiritual level and he wanted the messenger to come back. So the Radak and the, and the Targum Yonis and the Masudah says that the Malach, the angel, actually came back that very day. That day that Manoach prayed, the angel came back. And this was a big sign to Manoach because Manoach said, who knew that I prayed to Hashem asking for this thing? The fact that the, 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 the angel came, or the man of God came back, this is a clear indication that it's real. He already had it, started having suspicions. Maybe this is just a fraudster. Maybe it's some trickster, you know, with some scheme and some trap and some really um, bad motivation ca came to my wife and tried to prey on her innocence. The fact that he then prayed to Hashem, and that very day the person comes back with the same message, Manoach said, well, how did he know that I wanted to hear that message? Oh, it's, he's clearly being sent by Hashem. The Mamidra Rabbah says that the angel didn't come that same day, but it, Manoach waited till pray in the next morning. The next morning he prays, and on that very day, when that he prayed the next morning, then the angel comes back to Tzlal Foynes. Now, we mentioned some of the reasons, but the why did why was Manoir so upset that the prophets, who he believed was prophet, um, why did he want the prophet to come back? So the Rabbag says that he wanted to know if this is something he could rely on. You know, he heard he heard this from his wife, but he wants to know. You know, is this really reliable information that they're having a child and this child is going to somehow be uh, have all these special laws associated to him? It's laws that are very different than the way he understands uh, a nazir should operate. 
So he wanted to know. He said, I, I, want, I want this prophet to come back. I need to work out. Can I rely on this prophet? Additionally, the Masud says, I want to understand. The Manech said, I want to understand. Maybe if there's already some differences between the types of nausea that my future child's going to be, maybe there are more details as well that I need to know. What else is there that's going to be different about Shimshon that I need to know about? Additionally, a barman on the Malbim say, Manurch was suspicious. All this special detail for a child who seems to be nothing special, additionally, like he has all these special laws, but it doesn't sound like he's going to be doing anything special. Remember, so Alphonus never mentioned that part. So Manurch's now curious. There's something suspicious about this. He was right to be suspicious. She was literally, didn't give him all the information. He wasn't working with all the, with all the information at all. So he was very suspicious, rightfully so. He's like, all these special laws, but to what end? What's he, what's he going to do that's going to be very, very special? So, he, so Manerh begs Hashem, please send this person again. I need to understand what's going to be special about this, about this child. Now Hashem listens. Hashem sends the angel to come to the woman. She's now in the field, again, showing how careful she was. She'd been told whether that day or the day before about about the special laws she was in the field but she wouldn't go next to a, a vineyard anymore now that she was carrying this child she said not only am i not going to have wine i'm not even going to go into a vineyard Manoach wasn't with her and so the the woman tells the angel wait a second my husband was really distressed that he didn't get a chance to talk to you let me go and get my son let me let me go and get my husband so now you could tell retell the message to both of us together so Ababana says that the the why did the angel come now the second day? If the reason the angel came back was to give the message again to Manur because he was so distressed that he didn't get the message, why did the angel now come to Tzalal Foynes? She already had the message. She didn't need the message the second time. The angel should have just come to Manur and that would have been the end of the story. So number one, she was more prepared to, she was on a higher level, more spiritually high, and therefore she was more prepared to receive an angel. And secondly, the Barbanel says, Manur needed confirmation that the person he was now seeing was the same person that had given the message to his wife the day before. Maybe this was two people. So he needed to know, wait a second. Is this the same person? So the person first, the angel, but in this case, who they, who they assume is a prophet of Hashem, first came to Salafoinus. And then Salafoinus ran to the husband and said, the person who came yesterday, yes, he's come, about, he's come again, same person. The Medrash Rabbah says, that, that the reason why the angel came to Tzalal Foynes and not Manoyach is not to undo their original words. She came to Tzalal, to, to Tzalal Foynes because the angel didn't want to repeat the message. Manoyach so badly wants to hear the message of, from Hashem himself, but the angel doesn't want to repeat it. Because if the angel has to repeat it, according to the Adai Moshe, if the angel has to repeat it, well, then the angel's going to have to lie. Because the angel's going to have to say whose fault it was. And the angel, of course, is not going to tell Manoyach, by the way, it's your wife's fault. So the angel will be left lying, back to the same problem. So this dynamic of this, 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 you know, this difficulty in their marriage because of this big fight, it plays a very big part of the entire story. All the back and forth, that's kind of the backdrop of it all. Hashem does not want to cause agony between a husband and wife, and Hashem doesn't want to say something negative to a husband about a wife. And so therefore, this entire plot is all engineered in a very careful way so that Hashem wouldn't have to lie, because that was, that's what Hashem would have done. If Hashem was, had no choice, so to speak, Hashem would have lied rather than say something negative to a husband about his wife. So Hashem said, you know what? Let's avoid any form of lying. I'll rather make this about Salafonis. I'll come back to the Salafonis, and I'll tell through the angel, and I'll tell her to call her husband, and then I'll just say, oh, whatever I told her, you can rely on it. That way, we don't have to repeat the message again. Now, she ran to her husband, and she told her husband, behold, the man has appeared to me, who came to me during the day. And again, that's the reason why so many people say, oh, it happened the same, that same very day. And so, Manoyach follows after his wife. And he asked the angel if he was the person that spoke to the wife. And the malach, the angel, t- says, I am. So Manoach is now getting confirmation for what he's worried about. He was worried that maybe this is some form of, of, of misunderstanding or deception or malicious behavior. He's now confirming, okay, this is the person that spoke to my wife. Okay, now we get, now we get it. Now, the verse actually says that Manoach followed after his wife. And that 
that introduces us to a big discussion. And this is actually the origin where a lot of people say that Manoach wasn't such a scholar because he followed after his wife. And Nachman says this is proof that, that Manoach was ignorant because every school child understands that in the story of Rivka and Eliezer, when Rivka is leading Eliezer back to the house, Rivka follows after Eliezer. Everyone knows that, that the man was supposed to go for, first when walking in the street. In the case of Manoach, it says Manoach followed after his wife. Obviously, Manech didn't know what even a school child knows. And so, therefore, that's a, that's a proof that Manech wasn't such a great scholar. Rav Nachman by Yitzchak says, wait a second, that's not what I mean. It doesn't mean that he literally followed after her in the street. It means he followed her advice. She says, I, I saw an angel, come and follow me. So, just as Alkana and Elisha had done earlier on, when they followed the advice of someone and says they followed after them, it doesn't mean literally he followed after her, but it means that he followed, he followed her advice. She gave instruction. This is where I saw the person. Let's go, go. And both of them went. He didn't actually follow behind her in the streets. Rashi, Rashi literally translates it like this. Like the, it seems like Rashi is clearly following Rav Nachman by Yitzchak and says he followed after the advice of his wife. And the Masudah David says just pragmatically, he followed her because she knew where to go and he didn't. She had met the angel and she told the angel, wait a second, I'm going to run and get my husband. And now he's following after her because he doesn't know where to go. He wasn't the one that saw the angel, so he needs to follow after her. Thank you for listening to Untold Stories of the Torah. If you enjoyed this episode, Help us spread the word by subscribing to this channel and leaving us a review.